activists, authors, um, historians, and folks that, other folks <laughs> that use oral history um, in innovative ways. Um, tonight we have um, uh, a program about activism, which is appropriate um, on this election day, um, titled United in Anger, Historicizing Act Up. And we're going to hear from um, Jim Hubbard and Sarah Schulman. And um, if you'll just give me a moment here to introduce both uh, Jim and Sarah. Jim Hubbard has been making films since 1974, including Elegy in the Streets, Two Marches, The Dance, and Memento Mori. His films have been shown at the Berlin Film Festival, London Film Festival, the San Francisco Film Festival, and many other lesbian and gay film festivals. His film Memento Mori won the Ursula for Best Short Film at the Hamburg Lesbian and Gay Film Festival in 1995. In 1987, Jim and Sarah Schulman co-founded Mix, the New York Lesbian and Gay Experimental Film Video Festival, and that same year ACT UP again was founded um, with Jim and Sarah uh, together. Um, Jim is now the president of, uh, of the Mix. The Actually, I'm not the president anymore. Oh, no. The president is sitting behind me. Oh, well, maybe you could introduce yourself to us. Uh, I'm only, I've been demoted to treasurer. Oh, <laughs> yeah, please do introduce uh, yourself. My name is Aries Dela Cruz, and I'm the current president of Mix MIC. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And I also went to Columbia in 2009 for undergraduate. Thank you. Um, I'm going to continue with yes, Jim's. This is this is a very brief synopsis of Jim and Sarah's um, many, many accomplishments, so bear with me. Um, under the auspices of the Estate Project for Artists with AIDS, Jim created the Royal S. Marks AIDS Activist Video Collection at the New York Public Library. He curated the series Fever in the Archive, AIDS Activist Videotapes from the Royal S. Marks Collection for the Guggenheim Museum in New York. Um, and again, Jim has many, many accomplishments. Um, but we're going to move to Sarah, um, who co-founded in 1987, ACT UP with Jim. And no, she's, no, no, we did not co-found no? ACT UP. Oh, no, okay, all right, no, well. We are not co-founders of ACT UP. Okay, okay. well, okay. then I, I strike that. <laughs> okay. um, uh, uh, Sarah is widely published. Yeah. yeah. Okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> <laughs> not that one. <laughs> that um, would take it out of there. Right. Um, Many, many places, too many to name, but I'll just a few. The New York Times, The Nation, The Village Voice, and The Guardian um, has won a Guggenheim Award, is the author of 15 yeah. published or soon to be published works, four nonfiction books, a play, um, and nine novels translated into eight languages. Um, Sarah is also a filmmaker, professor of English at the City University of New York, as you mentioned earlier, um, a fellow at the New York Institute for Humanities at NYU on the advisory collective of the Human Rights and Social Movements Program at Harvard's Kennedy Center. And in recognition to her contributions um, to the communities, Sarah was made a Revson Fellow um, for the future of New York City here at Columbia. Um, and uh, Sarah's doing some interesting work in Palestine um, yeah. in the coming year. So um, please welcome Jim and Sarah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good night. I don't know if you know this, but I was yep. interviewed on BAI the other day, and they said Sarah and her husband, Jim Hall. Oh, my God. <laughs> I said, no, he's not my husband. And then they said, oh, her partner. Uh -huh. I was like, no. And it's like, they couldn't imagine that a man and a woman would be working together if they weren't a couple. It was so weird. <laughs> anyway, we've worked together for 25 years. So I anyway, I think we're going to start by each of us telling our different stories about our own history with the AIDS crisis and how we came to this. So I'm going to start. Um, I was a city hall reporter for the New York Native. The New York Native was the gay newspaper in New York. And at that time, Koch, the evil Ed Koch was mayor, and we were trying to get a gay rights bill passed. So at that time, you could be kicked out of a restaurant, you could be denied a job, you could be denied an apartment, you could be kicked out of a hotel if you were gay. In fact, I personally was kicked out of Kenny's Castaways on Bleecker Street because I was on a date with a woman and we were kissing and the waitress came over and said, I'm really sorry, but you're going to have to leave. And we had to leave. So that was the situation and people were trying to get a gay rights bill, which did finally get passed in 1986. But anyway, so I would go down to City Hall, say, Sarah Schulman from the New York Native, Mayor Koch, when are we going to pass the gay rights bill? So I was 23. 1981, um, AIDS was first noticed. Uh, AIDS, of course, has existed for decades before 1981. And in fact, in a number of our interviews, particularly with people who work with the homeless and with um, IV drug users, there was two phenomena, one called 
junkie pneumonia, which was basically PCP, and the other called the dropsies, I think, um, which was wasting syndrome, that were totally identified and recognized within drug user communities way before AIDS was identified. But it was only when AIDS was became visible in the white gay male community that science acknowledged that it existed or recognized it. And, and for those of you who don't know, originally it was identified as a gay cancer, Kaposi's sarcoma. And there was a thought that it was connected to homosexuality somehow inherently. In fact, uh, lesbians were not allowed to give blood at the beginning of the AIDS crisis because they thought it would have to do with homosexuality. So no one knew how it was transmitted or whatever. So it was totally by an accident of history that I happened to be on the scene as a girl reporter when AIDS started. And I covered a lot of early stories. I covered the closing of the bathhouses for the New York natives, um, the forming of the first PWA organizations. I then went on and became an, an AIDS reporter at the Village Voice. I wrote the first piece on women being excluded from experimental drug trials. I wrote the first piece on homeless people with AIDS that appeared anywhere, which was in the nation. And it was interesting because the nation was so homophobic that the only way they would cover AIDS was when it affected homeless people. And that's, you know, it's, and on one hand you have people who ignore homeless people with AIDS, and then you have people for whom it's more acceptable than gay people at that time. And I also covered uh, pediatric AIDS, which virtually doesn't exist anymore. Uh, for reasons that we'll go into later, which it has to do is an important part of the history of ACT UP. But at the time, there was a lot of pediatric AIDS in the city, and infants were being treated um, on a placebo basis. And this raised the issue of consent. What is consent? Which has been a question that has pervaded throughout the AIDS crisis. And it's still very pre present today, especially in vaccine research, which is not conducted in the United States, because we have more um, rigid uh, consent standards. So, um, so I was on this from the very early days, and the first five years of AIDS, there were 40,000 people died of AIDS from 81 to 85, I believe, or 86. There were no treatments. The only treatment was a recycled failed cancer drug called AZT that cost $10,000 a year and ultimately didn't work, but people didn't realize that. And then ACT UP was founded in 1987, and I was founded in February, I joined in July. So that's how I got to ACT UP. Um, my relationship to AIDS and to ACT UP um, is much like my relationship to the world, and that's um, through the lens of a camera. Um, I'm a filmmaker, and that's how I understand the world and, and, and literally look at the world. And I, st I started filming the um, gay movement in uh, the late 70s. And um, when, when I first became aware of AIDS in 1981 and in those few years, first few years, I, I wanted to make a film about AIDS. But it, it was, I couldn't figure out how to do it. It was really difficult. In the mainstream media, if they weren't ignoring people with AIDS, they were showing them as, you know, these horrible, shameful victims of this disgusting disease and uh, you know I wasn't gonna about to um, recreate that on, on some grassroots level I, I wanted to do something different and I <clears throat> it, um, I kind of found it around looking for a subject and um, I, I met this guy and um, who had AIDS and I started filming him but it, it didn't last very long because he, he didn't want me in his face with a, um, a camera all the time. Um, so th that didn't um, succeed. And then two things happened. One is my ex-lover, Roger Jacoby, was diagnosed with AIDS in um, August of 1984. And from then until his death in November of 1985, I um, filmed him. And because he was a filmmaker, he was used to having a camera around and also he, he wanted to be filmed. Um, and then when he died I inherited all his outtakes so I and he was something of a narcissist so he filmed himself a lot. Um, so so I had I had that work. And then um, then suddenly in in March of 1987 act up appeared and there there was 
something that was really exciting to film all of a sudden. So, um, um, because ACT UP was really conscious of media and wanting to um, do something that was um, visually interesting in order to get people's attention. So, so I had those two things. I had a personal relationship to, to AIDS and, and the political relationship to AIDS, and I can combine them in a film, which eventually, um, uh, it was finished in 1989, and it's called Elegy in the Streets, and it's a 30-minute silent, self-processed, um, experimental film about, um, about those things, the personal and political um, uh, experiences and reactions to, to AIDS. And so I, um, um, I first filmed ACT UP in June of 1987 at the Lesbian and Gay Pride March that year. They had a concentration camp because people were really afraid that the Reagan administration was going to um, uh, put quarantine people with AIDS. Um, and then the next thing I filmed was the 96-hour continuous picket of Memorial Sloan Kettering Hospital. There were a group of five to seven hospitals, um, I, including Columbia Presbyterian, for instance, um, uh, that were designated as AIDS Treatment Evaluation Units, ATEUs, and uh, these hospitals were supposed to do trials on drugs. And uh, I don't remember the exact numbers, but say Sloan Kettering was supposed to get 120 people enrolled in a trial. And, you know, after a year and spending all sorts of money, they had eight people. So ACT UP spent 96 hours um, embarrassing them and demanding that they, that they get to work. Uh, and then from that on, I, you know, I filmed um, ACT UP's demonstrations. And when I say filmed, I mean film. I, uh, mostly on 16 millimeter. Although um, at, a, at that time, there arose a, a movement, the AIDS activist video movement, where 40, 60, I don't, we don't know how many people um, who had access to uh, consumer grade video cameras. Video 8 cam came out in 1988, high 8 in 89. So suddenly, uh, middle class people could afford video cameras um, and, and relatively high quality ones. So, so there was a movement to document what wasn't being documented by the mainstream media and, and to create videotapes that could be sent around the country as VHS tapes and, and get the vital information that um, could help people uh, prolong their lives. So, uh, and now, um, also at that time, in 1988, I got a grant which consisted of a Video 8 camera. It was my first video camera. And I um, said I was going to do oral histories of ACT UP. I proceeded to do, I did seven of them. It was ten and a half hours of footage. And the filmmaker in me, who was used to dealing with two minute and 46 second reels of 16 millimeter film, looked at ten and a half hours of footage and said, oh my god, what am I going to do with this? How am I ever going to edit it? And I stopped doing it. And so the um, ACT UP Oral History Project is, at least in part, a corrective for that um, misunderstanding of the value of, of uh, raw footage and interviewing people. Okay, so let me just tell you a little bit about how we started this project. So, joined ACT UP, that, that that was my first action, Sloan Kettering, 1987. So you remember at that point there were no treatments. By 1996, the cocktail, what we call a cocktail, was a combination treatments were, all, were now in place. So within 10 years, ACT UP completely revolutionized treatments and forced through a lot of research and treatments became available, that's within quotation marks. If you are healthy, if you have insurance, if you have a home, you can get treatment if you can tolerate the treatment and you're HIV positive, you can live a full life in the United States. That's a lot of ifs. But that's basically what was achieved by 1996. At that point, ACT UP had de basically demobilized for a lot of reasons, uh, which we can go into later, and we all went on with our lives. Cut ahead, it's 2001. 
I'm in LA, I'm driving in around in a little white rental car, I'm listening to NPR, and they're saying, today is the 20th anniversary of AIDS. I think, oh, that's interesting. And then the, the announcer says, at first America had trouble with people with AIDS, but then they came around. Like I almost <laughs> crashed the car. <laughs> and I pulled over, I remember I had my first cell phone, and I called Jim from the side of the road. I was like, no, we have to do something about this. So we decided that we were going to start this project. Um, and we began interviewing people that we had known. And the interviews are long form. They're two to four hours each. No one is ever cut short. People can talk for as long as they wish. I've conducted all but two interviews. Jim and this other guy, James Wensey, are the camera guys. So basically, it's been a little mom and pop project. And because it's the two of us, we have been able to con cons consistently reconceptualize the project. I do not understand how an outsider can conduct oral histories, to tell you the truth. And I don't understand how rote questions can drive an oral history project. Both of those things are mysterious to me. Um, because every time we talk to somebody, we're finding out new information. We're reconceptualizing the, our understanding of the movement, how it functioned. And I want to, um, and I just want to tell you two things that we've I think we've come to understand from, from this process of changing questions. One is that how, how ACT UP worked. That the, the reason it was successful because was that there was a simultaneity of actions. That all different kinds of people were working on all different kinds of levels based on where they were at. And just as a very experienced political organizer, let me tell you, people can only be where they're at. So if you try to have a movement where you're controlling everyone and telling them what they can't do and what they can do and what they must do and where they must go, it's probably not going to work. But the thing about ACT UP was a true democracy and everybody was doing what they needed to do. So if you needed to work with the black church, you work with the black church. If you needed to go to Chinatown, you worked in Chinatown. If you needed to work on needle exchange, that's what you did. People, and because it was self-selected and it was going on simultaneously, that's how ACT UP was able to create change, because it was never a huge number of people. The largest demonstration they ever had was 7,000 people surrounding St. Patrick's Cathedral. But for the most part, it was between like four and 800 people. It was a, one of those uh, vanguard organizations where people were very, very focused. They had very fixed agendas, they, and they moved towards those agendas. So that was the first thing, one of the first things that we learned. Um, and the second thing we learned is that it was the opposite of Occupy Wall Street, in that ACT UP had very specific demands. And the way it was constructed was very, if you read Dr. King's letter from Birmingham Jail, he lays out a strategy very similar to ACT UP's, although we were not aware of that. We came to the same conclusion. First, he, what he calls self-education. So ACT UP became their experts on AIDS to the point where ACT UP was telling science what needed to be researched. They were telling, were saying what laws needed to be passed, what insurance policies needed to be passed. We were setting an agenda for everything that needed to change. We were the experts in every arena. We would develop the plan of how to get drugs to people who couldn't afford them and present those plans to the FDA. And we did all the conceptualization. Then we would present, a, a, make a demand that was demand that was reasonable and doable not something that, that was impossible. For example, um, ACT UP went to the Food and Drug Administration. Activists, authors, um, historians, and folks that, other folks <laughs> that use oral history um, in innovative ways. Um, tonight we have um, uh, a program about activism, which is appropriate um, on this election day, um, titled United in Anger, Historicizing ACT UP. And we're going to hear from um, Jim Hubbard and Sarah Schulman. And um, if you'll just give me a moment here to introduce both uh, Jim and Sarah. Jim Hubbard has been making films since 1974, including Elegy in the Streets, Two Marches, The Dance, and Memento Mori. His films have been shown at the Berlin Film Festival, London Film Festival, the San Francisco Film Festival, and many other lesbian and gay film festivals. His film Memento Mori won the Ursula for Best Short Film at the Hamburg Lesbian and Gay Film Festival in 1995. In 1987, Jim and Sarah Schulman co-founded MIX, the New York Lesbian and Gay Experimental Film Video Festival, and that same year, ACT UP, again, was founded. Um, 
with Jim and Sarah uh, together. Um, Jim is now the president of, a, of the mix. The Actually, I'm not the president anymore. Oh, no. The president is sitting behind me. Oh, well, maybe you could introduce <laughs> yourself to us. Uh, I'm I'm only, I've been demoted to treasurer. Oh. <laughs> yeah, please do introduce uh, yourself. My name is Aries Dela Cruz, and I'm the current president of Mix NYC. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And I also went to Columbia 2009 for undergraduate. Thank you. Um, I'm going to continue with yeah, Jim's. This sorry, is this yes. is a very brief synopsis of Jim and Sarah's um, many many accomplishments. So bear with me. Um, under the auspices of the Estate Project for Artists with AIDS, Jim created the Royal S. Marks AIDS Activist Video Collection at the New York Public Library. He curated the series Fever in the Archive, AIDS Activist Videotapes from the Royal S. Marks Collection for the Guggenheim Museum in New York. Um, and again, Jim has many, many accomplishments, um, but we're going to move to Sarah, um, who co-founded in 1987, ACT UP with Jim. Uh, no, she's, no, no, we did not no? co-found ACT UP. Oh, no, okay, all right, no, well. We are not co-founders of ACT UP. Okay, okay. well, okay. then I, I strike that. <laughs> okay. um, uh, uh, Sarah is widely published. Yeah. yeah. Okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> <laughs> not that one. That um, can't get out of it. All right. um, Many, many places, too many to name, but I'll just a few. The New York Times, The Nation, The Village Voice, and The Guardian um, has won a Guggenheim Award, is the author of 15 yeah. published or soon to be published works, four nonfiction books, a play, um, and nine novels translated into eight languages. Um, Sarah is also a filmmaker, professor of English at the City University of New York, as you mentioned earlier, um, a fellow at the New York Institute for Humanities at NYU on the advisory collective of the Human Rights and Social Movements program at Harvard's Kennedy Center. And in recognition to her contributions um, to the communities, Sarah was made a Revson Fellow um, for the future of New York City here at Columbia. Right. Um, and uh, Sarah's doing some interesting work in Palestine um, yeah. in the coming year. So um, please welcome Jim and Sarah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know if you know this, but I was yep. interviewed on BAI the other day, and they said, Sarah and her husband, Jim Hall. Oh, my God. <laughs> I said, no, he's not my husband. And then they said, oh, her partner. Uh -huh. I was like, no. I, was like, I couldn't imagine that a man and woman would be working together if they weren't a couple. It was so weird. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, we've worked together for 25 years. So I anyway, I think we're going to start by each of us telling our different stories about our own history with the AIDS crisis and how we came to this. So I'm going to start. Um, I was a city hall reporter for the New York Native. The New York Native was the gay newspaper in New York. And at that time, Koch, the evil Ed Koch was mayor, and we were trying to get a gay rights bill passed. So at that time, you could be kicked out of a restaurant, you could be denied a job, you could be denied an apartment, you could be kicked out of a hotel if you were gay. In fact, I personally was kicked out of Kenny's Castaways on Bleecker Street because I was on a date with a woman and we were kissing and the waitress came over and said, I'm really sorry, but you're gonna have to leave. And we had to leave. So that was the situation and people were trying to get a gay rights bill, which did finally get passed in 1986. But anyway, so I would go down to City Hall, say, Sarah Shulman from the New York Native, Mayor Koch, when are we gonna pass the gay rights bill? So I was 23. 1981, um, AIDS was first noticed. Uh, AIDS, of course, has existed for decades before 1981. And in fact, in a number of our interviews, particularly with people who work with the homeless and with um, IV drug users, there was two phenomena, one called junkie pneumonia, which was basically PCP, and the other called the dropsies, I think, um, which was wasting syndrome, that were totally identified and recognized within drug user communities way before AIDS was identified. But it was only when AIDS was became visible in the white gay male community that science acknowledged that it existed or recognized it. And, and for those of you who don't know, originally it was identified as a gay cancer, Kaposi sarcoma, and there was a thought that it was connected to homosexuality somehow inherently. In fact, uh, lesbians were not allowed to give blood at the beginning of the AIDS crisis because they thought it had to do with homosexuality. So no one knew how it was transmitted or whatever. So it was totally by an accident of history that I happened to be on the scene as a girl reporter when AIDS started. And I covered a lot of early stories. I covered the closing of the bathhouses for the New York Native. 
um, the forming of the first PWA organizations. I then went on and became um, an AIDS reporter at the Village Voice. I wrote the first piece on women being excluded from experimental drug trials. I wrote the first piece on homeless people with AIDS that appeared anywhere, which was in The Nation. And it was interesting because The Nation was so homophobic that the only way they would cover AIDS was when it affected homeless people. And that's, you know, it's, on one hand you have people who ignore homeless people with AIDS, and then you have people for whom it's more acceptable than gay people at that time. And I also covered uh, pediatric AIDS, which virtually doesn't exist anymore. Um, for reasons that we'll go into later, which it has to do is an important part of the history of ACT UP. But at the time, there was a lot of pediatric AIDS in the city, and infants were being treated um, on a placebo basis. And this raised the issue of consent. What is consent? Which has been a question that has pervaded throughout the AIDS crisis. And it's still very pre present today, especially in vaccine research, which is not conducted in the United States, because we have more um, rigid uh, consent standards. So, um, so I was on this from the very early days, and the first five years of AIDS, there were 40,000 people died of AIDS from 81 to 85, I believe, or 86. There were no treatments. The only treatment was a recycled failed cancer drug called AZT that cost $10,000 a year and ultimately didn't work, but people didn't realize that. And then ACT UP was founded in 1987, and I was founded in February, I joined in July. So that's how I got to ACT UP. Um, my relationship to AIDS and to ACT UP um, is much like my relationship to the world, and that's um, through the lens of a camera. Um, I'm a filmmaker, and that's how I understand the world and, and, and literally look at the world. And I, st I started filming the um, gay movement in uh, the late 70s. And um, when, when I first became aware of AIDS in 1981 and in those few years, first few years, I, I wanted to make a film about AIDS. But it, it was, I couldn't figure out how to do it. It was really difficult. In the mainstream media, if they weren't ignoring people with AIDS, they were showing them as, you know, these horrible, shameful victims of this disgusting disease. And uh, you know, I wasn't gonna about to um, recreate that on, on some grassroots level. I, I wanted to do something different. And I, <clears throat> it, um, I kind of found it around looking for a subject. And um, I, I met this guy and, um, who had AIDS and I started filming him, but it, it didn't last very long because he, he didn't want me in his face with a, um, a camera all the time. Um, so th that didn't um, succeed. And then two things happened. One is my ex-lover, Roger Jacoby, was diagnosed with AIDS in um, August of 1984. And from then until his death in November of 1985, I um, filmed him. And because he was a filmmaker, he was used to having a camera around and also he, he wanted to be filmed. Um, and then when he died I inherited all his outtakes so I and he was something of a narcissist so he filmed himself a lot. Um, so so I had I had that work. And then um, then suddenly in in March of 1987 Act Up appeared and there there was something that was really exciting to film all of a sudden. So, um, um, because ACT UP was really conscious of media and wanting to um, do something that was um, visually interesting in order to get people's attention. So, so I had those two things. I had a personal relationship to, to AIDS and, and the political relationship to AIDS, and I can combine them in a film, which eventually, um, uh, it was finished in 1989, it's called Elegy in the Streets, and it's a 30-minute silent, self-processed um, experimental film about, um, about those things, the personal and political um, um, experiences and reactions to, to AIDS. And so I, um, um, I first filmed Act Up in June of 1987 at the 
Lesbian and Gay Pride March that year. They had a concentration camp because people were really afraid that the Reagan administration was going to um, uh, put quarantine people with AIDS. Um, and then the next thing I filmed was the 96-hour continuous picket of Memorial Sloan Kettering Hospital. There were a group of five to seven hospitals, um, I, including Columbia Presbyterian, for instance, um, uh, that were designated as AIDS treatment evaluation units, ATEUs, and uh, these hospitals were supposed to do trials on drugs. And uh, I don't remember the exact numbers, but say Sloan Kettering was supposed to get 120 people enrolled in a trial. And, you know, after a year and spending all sorts of money, they had eight people. So ACT UP spent 96 hours uh, embarrassing them and demanding that they, that they get to work. Uh, and then from that on, I, you know, I filmed uh, ACT UP's demonstrations, and when I say filmed, I mean film, I, uh, mostly on 16 millimeter, although um, at, a, at that time there arose a, a movement, the AIDS activist video movement, where 40, 60, I don't, we don't know how many people um, who had access to uh, consumer grade video cameras, Video 8 cam came out in 1988, I-8 in 89, so suddenly uh, middle class people could afford video cameras um, and and relatively high quality ones. So so there was a movement to document what wasn't being documented by the mainstream media, and and to create videotapes that could be sent around the country as VHS tapes and and get the vital information that um, could help people uh, prolong their lives. So uh, and now. Um, also at that time, in 1988, I got a grant which consisted of a Video 8 camera. It was my first video camera. And I um, said I was going to do oral histories of ACT UP. I proceeded to do, I did seven of them. It was ten and a half hours of footage. And the filmmaker in me, who was used to dealing with two minute and 46 second reels of 16 millimeter film, looked at ten and a half hours of footage and said, oh my god, what am I going to do with this? How am I ever going to edit it? And I stopped doing it. And so the um, ACT UP Oral History Project is, at least in part, a corrective for that um, misunderstanding of the value of, of uh, raw footage and interviewing people. Okay, so let me just tell you a little bit about how we started this project. So, joined ACT UP, that 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 was my first action, Sloan Kettering, 1987. So you remember at that point there were no treatments. By 1996, the cocktail, we call a cocktail, was a combination treatments were, all, were now in place. So within 10 years, ACT UP completely revolutionized treatments and forced through a lot of research and treatments became available, that's within quotation marks. If you are healthy, if you have insurance, if you have a home, you can get treatment if you can tolerate the treatment and you're HIV positive, you can live a full life in the United States. That's a lot of ifs. But that's basically what was achieved by 1996. At that point, ACT UP had de basically demobilized for a lot of reasons, uh, which we can go into later, and we all went on with our lives. Cut ahead, it's 2001. I'm in LA, I'm driving in around in a little white rental car, I'm listening to NPR, and they're saying, today is the 20th anniversary of AIDS. I think, oh, that's interesting. And then the, the announcer says, at first America had trouble with people with AIDS, but then they came around. Like I almost crashed the car. <laughs> and I pulled over, I remember I had my first cell phone, and I called Jim from the side of the road. I was like, no, we have to do something about this. So we decided that we were gonna start this project. Um, and we began interviewing people that we had known, and the interviews are long form, they're two to four hours each. No one has ever cut short. People can talk for as long as they wish. I've conducted all but two interviews. Jim and this other guy, James Wincy, are the camera guys. So basically, it's been a little mom and pop project. And because it's the two of us, we have been able to con cons consistently reconceptualize the project. 
I do not understand how an outsider can conduct oral histories, to tell you the truth. And I don't understand how rote questions can drive an oral history project. Both of those things are mysterious to me. Um, because every time we talk to somebody, we're finding out new information. We're reconceptualizing the, our understanding of the movement, how it functioned. And I want to, um, and I just want to tell you two things that we've, I think we've come to understand from, from this process of changing questions. One is that how, how ACT UP worked. That the, the reason it was successful because was that there was a simultaneity of actions that all different kinds of people were working on all different kinds of levels based on where they were at. And just as a very experienced political organizer, let me tell you, people can only be where they're at. So if you try to have a movement where you're controlling everyone and telling them what they can't do and what they can do and what they must do and where they must go, it's probably not going to work. But the thing about ACT UP was a true democracy and everybody was doing what they needed to do. So if you needed to work with the black church, you work with the black church. If you needed to go to Chinatown, you worked in Chinatown. If you needed to work on needle exchange, that's what you did. People, and because it was self-selected and it was going on simultaneously, that's how ACT UP was able to create change. Because it was never a huge number of people. The largest demonstration they ever had was 7,000 people surrounding St. Patrick's Cathedral. But for the most part, it was between like four and 800 people. It was a, one of those uh, vanguard organizations where people were very, very focused. They had very fixed agendas. They, and they moved towards those agendas. So that was the first thing, one of the first things that we learned. Um, and the second thing we learned is that it was the opposite of Occupy Wall Street, in that ACT UP had very specific demands. And the way it was constructed was very, if you read Dr. King's letter from Birmingham jail, he lays out a strategy very similar to ACT UP's, although we were not aware of that. We came to the same conclusions. First, he, what he calls self-education. So ACT UP became their experts on AIDS to the point where ACT UP was telling science what needed to be researched. They were telling, were saying what laws needed to be passed, what insurance policies needed to be passed. We were setting an agenda for everything that needed to change. We were the experts in every arena. We would develop the plan of how to get drugs to people who couldn't afford them and present those plans to the FDA. And we did all the conceptualization. Then we would present, a, a, make a demand that was reasonable. That's true. However, I'm an optimist. I'll tell you why. <laughs> I've gotten very involved with the, the queer movement in Palestine. I'm a big advocate of queer Palestine, and I've been working with them for two years. And I can tell you that from what I've observed globally, there is a very radical queer movement that is emerging that's very tied into issues like occupation, colonialism, the global south in a way that the U.S. bourgeois queer movement is left in the dust. And that's the movement that's re-radicalizing. So if you're looking at things like homo-nationalism, do you know what that is? Homo-nationalism is where, like in countries like Holland or Germany, where white gay people pretty much have the same rights as straight people, you're seeing a certain sector of those p white people identifying with racist movements that are anti-immigrant inside their own nation because they're no longer in contradiction for being gay, right? So they're moving into their racial position. I mean, in the United States, we don't have rights. We don't have equal rights. Although, don't ask, don't tell is a homo-nationalist impulse, you know. But the critique of that is a global critique. I mean, it was identified by Jezbir Puar, who's a professor at Rutgers, but most of the action around homonationalism is global. So, I mean, that's where the future of the queer movement is, in my view. But that's off topic. Or is it? <laughs> um, can you talk some about the difficulty of uh, being an activist, but on the other hand, needing to learn such difficult technical um, information about epidemiology, about HIV, about drugs. I mean, on one hand, 
people were living it, and of course, like their bodies were very much almost like experimental. But on the other hand, you know, they weren't formally trained. So you talk about how ACT UP was really kind of a group of experts. Can you talk a little bit more about how you think that was even accomplished in the first place, given the high barriers to knowledge? Do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, I think, you know, when you really need to know something, um, it becomes a lot easier. I, um, my, um, my personal experience actually predates um, AIDS, predates AIDS actually. It's with when, when um, I first started processing my own film, <clears throat> uh, I had to know, learn about uh, organic chemistry. So suddenly I could go into um, the Carnegie Library in Pittsburgh and read organic chemistry, you know, graduate level organic chemistry textbooks. And it made sense to me. And when I, you know, like when I was in high school, um, it, you know, like I remember learned these rote formulas, but I, it, I couldn't understand it. So when when you sit down and learn it, and what the what the guys did in treatment and data committee was, they just they just first of all, it was much more difficult to get the information, but they managed to, by making all these phone calls, you know, you just start calling people and say, you know, what, what trials are going on. And, and, so, and they would make a list of them so that people could actually try to get into the trials. But also, they were reading these abstracts, and they were sitting there with, um, with dictionaries and just looking up one word after another. And, you know, after a while, it starts making sense to you. Um, and then suddenly, then uh, someone had the idea of creating a glossary. Mm -hmm. So they typed up a glossary and Xeroxed it. There was an immense Xerox bill <laughs> in, uh, in ACT UP. And also people who worked in copy shops who would do it for mm -hmm. free, but still, you know, it's actually one of the um, ongoing things about ACT UP. How much are we spending in, in, uh, in Xeroxing? Mm -hmm. so, so these things, you know, like people just, went to school and they, um, they got PhDs in um, organic chemistry, except they don't have the, the parchment from Columbia to, to <laughs> show for oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh. There are, I don't know what they are. Okay. I mean, it was interesting because when I first saw your first cut, mm -hmm. I realized that you, the shots you had pulled were from ACT UP's point of view, were like shot from inside the demonstrations, from inside the meetings, and that you were making a dis an aesthetic decision. You know, that visually the film would look like what we saw. You know, and that was really in inspiring. Yeah, I mean, that, the film is is from ACT UP's point of view. In fact, there um, there's my editor had to force me to put in um, a little bit of um, mass media or uh, mainstream media. So there's like a shot of Tom Brokaw and 20 seconds of Dan Rather and two articles from the New York Times. But, but you know, I don't really care about that. They, they weren't telling the real story anyway. The real story was, was, was on, the, on the ground. And so that's what, um, that's what I want to show. <coughs> I mean, I th entitlement, 
This is something that I learned from ACT UP. Entitlement allows people to enter into institutions and believe that they have the right to be part of them. Like in 1979, when I was 21, I was in an action called the Women's Action at the Pentagon. And women went and wove a, we wove a web of women's rage around the Pentagon with you know, knitting and stuff like that. Anyway, when I was in ACT UP, I thought, isn't that funny? We never thought about going into the Pentagon. But ACT UP would go into the FDA or into the CDC. I mean, it's an entirely different self-perception that you have a right to be inside the apparatus. You know, it really elevates how you imagine your task. You can but it also rubs off, you know, I mean, because people who would normally not feel that way took on, took on that stance or were capable of taking on that stance because, because of the group. Like, for example, when the Gulf War first started, we had this thing called the Day of Desperation, and a group of people decided they were going to interrupt the evening news. So, um, and they wanted to say, fight AIDS, not Arabs. So they had to get into the Dan Rather broadcast. Well, someone in ACT UP used to work at CBS News, and she drew a map for them of the entire structure of the studio <laughs> and gave them her ID card, which our brilliant artists copied, so they all had phony IDs. And they got in and they interrupted the, the evening news. But if we hadn't had someone who knew the inside system, we wouldn't have been able to get in. But she wasn't the one who went in. Do you see what I mean? Just a real follow-up question. Yeah. Uh, um, I guess what I'm wondering also is how you can have an organization that complains so as effective as that was for such a relatively long period of time when you had attitudes that they would take Brian Kramer I can tell you what I figured out for myself about that. You could spend your whole life trying to convince one person to change their mind. Forget it. You don't need to have consensus in an organization. All you need to have is critical mass. So if you need X number of people to run the CDC campaign for four years, that's all you need. If these other people are against you and don't want to do it, forget about them. People spend so much political energy trying to force consensus trying to force everyone to see things the same way, trying to stop people from doing things they want to do. Forget about that. If you believe in something, do it. If somebody else wants to do something you don't want to do, let them do it. It's hard, but to, I really think ACT UP proves that that is the most effective way. But and also ACT UP worked in very different ways. I mean, there were the very large um, actions that involved almost everybody in the group. Then there were, and there were affinity groups within ACT UP so that those individual affinity groups could do certain particular things within those actions, but they could also go off and do things on their own that the, the, the large group didn't have to, um, um, to support necessarily, although, you know, because of the, the ethos of ACT UP, the, the, everything fed into the, to the larger whole. Um, and then there were smaller things like zaps, that somebody, somebody would come up with an idea on, on a Monday night and, and ask about it at the meeting and 10 people would go and do something on Tuesday. So, so there, were, there was a whole range of activities that, that could be supported with, within the, lar the larger group. But don't, you can't try to control other people in that situation. And, and nobody was trying to do that. Yeah. Um, well, I was thinking it's like the organization that even though everybody, you know, had the ability to do their own thing, that there was this large commitment to nonviolence. I mean, were there groups that wanted to, to go to the extreme and break the nonviolence? Actually, the only person who ever called for that was Larry Kramer. <laughs> He made a speech saying that we had to take up arms, but nobody listened to him. <laughs> but there's a lot of reasons why ACT UP was, was nonviolent, and I think they're worth examining. One is just gay people generally. I mean, straight people go and gay bash gay people, right, all the time. It happens all the time. But have you ever heard of gay people bashing a straight person? Really not. I mean, there's one example I can think of in the West Village a couple of years ago. But really, for the most part, gay people don't do that. 
So that kind of thing is not already in the community culture. The second thing was that it's not strategic. Like, you can have ideological reasons being for nonviolence, but simply from a practical point of view, you can't win against the US government if you use violence. So, and then a lot of these people were sick. You know, so I mean, there were just a lot of reasons not to have violence. There was violence against us. One of our members was severely brain damaged. We have footage of the riot police just beating the shit out of people. I mean, they, there was violence against us, but we never committed an act of violence. And when you think that people knew they were dying to the extent that they were plotting their political funerals and they still didn't take anybody with them, it's quite amazing. But I didn't. I didn't mean to imply that I felt that you couldn't understand them. So right. I certainly, I believe that everyone can. In fact, I mean, I wouldn't, wouldn't be doing this project, wouldn't be making a film if I didn't believe that everyone is capable of understanding this and actually taking um, 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 messages from it that go way beyond anything that I would particularly think of. Um, but, um, but simply that because you weren't around, but also um, that you don't have the information about it. You don't know what's going on. But, but the information has, has been suppressed. I mean, this, is, this is, has been erased from history. And one of our major um, um, impetuses behind this project is to force the history of ACT UP and AIDS activism into mainstream US history. Yeah, like we want to, uh, like we think that, that, I mean, it shocks me that U.S., 20th century U.S. history core classes do not have sections on AIDS and AIDS activism. And we went to the American Historical Association to try to like push this into the core curriculum and the only people who came to our talk were gay. It was so frustrating. We want all U.S. 20th century core, I mean, how can they not discuss AIDS? It's absurd. Right. So we're hoping that this film, teachers will be able to show it. They won't have to learn anything. They won't have to teach it. They can just show it. <laughs> you know. But basically, I mean, the main message is that regular people can change the world. And in fact, only regular people change the world. <coughs> and when you interview, I mean, like these, it's when you go through the intervals, you, you'll see. These are just regular people who rose to the, the, you know, the historic challenge. And that's why it worked. Uh, yes, I think it, it's it is okay. ready. So we, yeah. we wanted to propose a plan for the government, so we wanted to arrange a meeting with the government, uh, which we had um, with the eight star at that point, and Johnny Rujan at that point in Puerto Rico. And ACTA paid for this. ACTA paid for it. ACTA paid for it. So I was, you know, one of the things was that we we went like. It was calling people we knew. Like I called a friend who uh, rented condominiums, and I said, "Could you really help me with this?" And he gave us a very cheap deal, and we put everybody <laughs> in one uh, in one apartment. Um, then we will have meetings, you know, in the houses of people that we will. Me and Carlos will go to the bars, mm -hmm. and because we had a history in the community before, people knew who we were not in that capacity. We went with the silence equal death speaker, the Spanish one. And you know, we'll go with our act of outfits, little short jeans and boots, and um, <laughs> go to people, smile, and put a sticker in the chest, and they'll go like, what's this? Oh, you wanna know? And we'll say, well, come to this meeting. And it was, it was amazing because then the other people came, the other act of members, Latinos, and other also non-Latinos members but you know, my memory is 
know, that gray now. And they, you know, we started to do the same, go out and put stickers on people and just say, oh, come on and see. And um, then we knew some, some, mem some owner of the bar and they, of course, they were, at that point, people were getting sick and dying. So he opened the bar for meetings, and, and I remember like in two weeks we had like a meeting of 200 people, you know, which he was for Puerto Rico, you know, it's like, um, and, you know, it was a really rough conversation to negotiate if they really needed an act of a chapter or they just needed to, you know, start the fire and they take it from there and we leave because we were not going to stay. Uh, which was my main concern. You know, you don't go there and say, you need to have an act out, because uh, we were not there. Yeah. Um, so that was one of the, you know, I think big things we accomplished there. I, we have a series of, of demonstrations. We had one, and the first time uh, Sullivan was having a meeting with the Department of Health in front of a hotel, we had like 10, 20 people, but we got media coverage. Then we had another demonstration um, at the, the commission meeting, and we were getting more, and it was all like to in crescendo to get to, we wanted to do a march, you know, in all San Juan. And it all, you know, it all happened. We, we began to get more people and more people, and then, you know, we had a pretty successful march in all San Juan, uh, we will say the gobierno tiene sangre en sus manos, the same thing, the government has blood in their hands. Um, and um, so it was pretty powerful because it was the first time um, there, was, there was a very activist-like direct action, you know, taken there. Um, so that's ACT UP and Puerto Rico. And so did they end up with an ACT UP chapter? Or? Uh, well, they started an ACT UP chapter. Mm -hmm. it, of course, that I knew this, it was not going to evolve as ACT UP. And I think what it did was that, you know, for one year, two, some people kept meeting as ACT UP, but then, then other groups started, you know, with their flavor, mm -hmm. with their needs. And... Um, and even the P flat chapter started. You know, it was for me. It was more. It was not about having a successful active chapter. But was just to, you know, set the fire up. And and I think it started. You know, to to extend to other people that wouldn't even think to do it at that point. possible to kind of think about ACT UP as kind of maybe a planting seeds only of oh different sure. groups, like Housing Works and well, Housing Works came Human out of Action ACT UP. Group and all yeah. these groups that came out of ACT UP. And also the South African AIDS movement. I mean, ACT, yeah. actually Mark De Visser was an, a South African in exile here in ACT UP New York, and then he went back to South Africa, and a lot of the tactics were directly imported from ACT UP New York. Yeah, that's true, but I, even more so, I think the way queer people view themselves is is completely transformed by ACT UP. You know, even in, in a way even larger than, than any of those things. Like why? Because if you were a queer kid in Iowa and you're on t and you look on TV and there are these guys and they're all wearing their baseball caps backwards and their um, Doc Martens or whatever and they're in something mass at St. Patrick's Cathedral, you have a model for yourself as a, as a player, as a political force, you know, and it just, I think it changed people's sense of, of what was po possible for them. But, you know, it's the global, I mean, the situation here is so different than the global situation. It's like, there's two opposite phenomena, and that's really where we completely lost. Yeah. Yes. Um, I actually have a question on that about um, just from your perspective, um, what are some of those factors that led to this pervasive perception that AIDS is no longer an issue in the United States? Like you said that you heard on um, 
on NPR and we're kind of... Dad, I can blame it on one person, Andrew Sullivan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Andrew Sullivan <laughs> did a cover story in the New York Times. Do you remember the date? Is it 1990? Oh, it was, it was sometime in 96. Yeah, so. yeah. 95. 95. 95. The yeah. end of AIDS. Yeah. The end of AIDS. Because he became undetectable, so AIDS was over. Right? Mm. That just did so much damage mm -hmm. because it was just like the poster boy for white, you know, right wing. He was a Bush, Bush supporter at one point. And um, we've been dealing with that ever since. And can you talk a little bit more about just kind of the role of media in terms of, um, you know, there is this criticism of media as just giving the wrong information. And, you know, you saw that in the Cosmopolitan Demonstration 98, the Women's Committee, um, and you saw that with the Brokaw um, break in. Um, but, do you think that ACTIV kind of pioneered uh, almost like a hijacking um, the news media to kind of... Well, we forced them. I mean, at that time, not only would the New York Times not cover AIDS, they wouldn't use the word gay. Mm -hmm. And if you died and you had a partner, you weren't allowed to have one. They wouldn't mention it in the obituaries. They wouldn't say that people died of AIDS. And I remember when the New York Times got their first fax machine, act up fax them a mile of black paper. <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't receive any faxes. <laughs> you know, and, and then act up made a mock New York Times called New York Crimes that they went around and put in all the boxes. I mean, and eventually they were forced to cover AIDS. Yeah. But you know, even when they were covering AIDS, it, it, the, the reporters were just not very good, and there was lots of information, and they would, yeah, uh, you know, reporters, right? there, was, you know, there was Gina Colada and Gina Lawrence Altman, right. and basically, um, I mean, she just made a mishmash of science, and his problem was that he loved to take government uh, mm -hmm. press releases and just, um, you retype know, retype them. them, yeah. The only good AIDS so. reporter there was Linda Villarosa, do you know her? She's a, an out lesbian. She used to be an editor at Essence magazine, and she did a four-part series on the front page of the New York Times about black women and HIV, it's, which is, in my mind, the best thing that's ever been written on black women and HIV. Mm -hmm. She was the highest-ranking black woman at the New York Times at that time. So her coverage was really excellent. It was, a, you know, it was about um, black women being socially coerced into unsafe sex because of the black male shortage, however you want it to, to, to however you analyze that. And, you know, that's the kind of reporting that does not appear in the New York Times. Mm -hmm. What was her name? Linda Villarosa, V-I-L-L-A-R-O-S-A. -L -L mm -hmm. She's currently doing a two-part series for Frontline on the history of black people and AIDS. She's like the expert on black people and AIDS in the United States. Yeah? Go oh. ahead. <laughs> keep asking questions. Go, go, go. Uh, sure. is, are there any um, kind of uh, disappointments that you see kind of in the current historical interpretation of HIV AIDS, especially with kind of like official government accounts. Um, I know the 30 year anniversary was kind of introduced with big fanfare and events and whatnot, but were the things that were Well, the, the, the thing that I hate is that they're all using the, the progress narrative, mm -hmm. which is a false narrative. Mm -hmm. And if you try to complicate it, it's not permissible. It always has to be that things get better as time passes, mm -hmm. you know. And, you know, why we have a higher infection rate in Washington, D.C. than in West Africa, I would like to know the answer to that. But that's, that is an indication that we don't have a progress narrative going on. Mm -hmm. And also, they take credit for what, for things that they were forced into. You know? Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, um, you know, it was out of the goodness of their hearts that they started doing all this research. Mm -hmm. Oh, we yeah. spoke at the NIH. Yeah. This was so crazy. We had gone to the demonstration at the NIH where our friends who are now dead were, got arrested and hauled off to jail. And then years later, and then we were, where people were arrested with police wearing yellow rubber gloves. I mean, so insanely demeaning. Years later, Jim and I were invited <laughs> to give a talk at the NIH. And we went in, we walked right in this time, we gave our little <laughs> yeah. talk, and this woman said, oh, I was the NIH librarian at the time of that demonstration, and after everyone left, I ran outside and collected all the, um, the memorabilia the and put it in our collection. But isn't it wonderful that Dr. Fauci had the uh, visionary insight to realize that everyone needed to have a seat at the table, 
And we were like, wow, that is not what happened. <laughs> you know, uh, these people are friends. We could tell you their names. They died forcing you to let us have a seat at the table. You know, and they just, and even though she washed it out the window, she couldn't remember what had really happened. Because it's just a lack of accountability, profound lack of accountability. Yes. Um, kind of on that note, could you speak? I mean, it's no longer the, the community mobilization uh, champ. The, oh, champ. And there, are, they used to have the HIV prevention justice campaign, and around. If you could speak to that a little bit, or what? I'm and, really not a big fan of champ, so maybe I shouldn't. Do you have any? Um, I don't. Yeah, I don't know enough about it to talk about. It. Okay. Uh, what could there? I guess what could their advocacy? What could have been improved by their advocacy strategy? If they don't want to go into that. No. Okay. And then second, my second question was, um, I'm a little confused. It, isn't active still in existence in Paris and in Philly? And, and, and in New York, yes. you know. It, yeah, um, yeah it but does. they're very it's small. Just yeah. smaller than it was. Yeah. Yes, there's a hand over here. I mean, there were 140 chapters that arose spontaneously okay, in the um, late 80s and, and early 90s. And how many and are there now? Um, three. three or four. Okay. Uh, Kenya, also. Mm -hmm. Well, it's partially what Jim was saying that the camcorder got invented in the middle of ACT UP. So ACT UP, in a sense, invented video activism. And I mean, the whole YouTube phenomena, they are really the precursor to that. Because ACT UP, we had a variety of different video teams and collectives. They would shoot the tape, and then they would bring the tape to the television stations. So we were really producing our own media at, you know, very early on in the development of video. The other thing is we were very media savvy. We had people, Mike Signorelli, who ran the media committee, had come from People magazine. We had people who, had, who came from very high levels of, uh, like I said, CBS and all this kind of stuff. So like we would time demonstrations for live feeds for the evening news, for example. Things like that. You know, they were just very smart about that. Um, it, Jim shows in the film that at the first, at the action at the Food and Drug Administration, the national press came for the first time to an active demonstration. And we already had people with AIDS from cities all over the country, many of whom were very ill in wheelchairs, et cetera, sitting there saying what city they were from so that their national, their press could come and interview them. We constructed that for the media to facilitate coverage. Right, and actually it, it started earlier than that. I remember um, Michelangelo's story about how um, in preparation for the, um, um, the um, FDA demonstration, it was got Chip Duckett, who he had, his job had been um, he, um, arranging cookbook um, tours. So people who wrote cookbooks would go on these tours and, and they would set up um, interviews in all these cities uh, and towns across the United States on the little TV programs or um, uh, radio programs. So he knew this circuit. And what he did is he recruited people all around the country. And, and they did these trainings over the phone. And they had the whole um, press packet that all these people had. So, so there was all this um, um, work done before the, um, the demonstration to get, pe get the reporters to um, Rockville, Maryland and interested, already interested, and then there were the people who satisfied that interest. But to go back to your question about how um, ACT UP used media, there were several things. One is, okay, so there are all these people um, uh, videotaping, and they were organized into several collectives. One, Testing the Limits, was a group of about six people. They made a tape called Testing the Limits, which is where their name came from, and then Voices from the Front, which was sort of uh, made in 92 in a kind of overview of the movement up until then. Then there was a much larger group called Diva TV, Damned Interfering Video Activist Television. And there, there was a core group of 10 or 12, but as many as 40 people videotaped for, 
or Diva TV. And, and they made finished tapes, and the tapes were uh, designed for people to show in, in meetings, and they sent them all around the country, and people would show it to their friends and their um, colleagues and, and neighbors in, in these little meetings. Um, but also, they would document, um, they, they focused on the police to, to keep um, the police in line and, and in cases where um, people were charged with crimes that they didn't commit. There was videotape to prove that they hadn't, hadn't done what they were being charged with. So there were lots of uses of, of um, video that, that uh, ACT UP um, employed. Now, do you, uh, how important was public access? Um, <coughs> oh, right, that? yes, right. There was um, public access. When did public access? Well, public access started in the 70s, you know, like Lanesville Public Television. But it, um, it ACT UP, the first um, AIDS-related program was uh, the GMHC Living with AIDS um, program. And that started, I think, in 87. Um, and that, that, that was run by Jean Carlo Musto and Greg Bordowitz and then a succession of, of, of people. Uh, ACT UP had two programs. There was um, AIDS Community Television, which um, James Wensey started. He's our, he's our camera person. He essentially made 150 half-hour programs all by himself. I mean, he would film it edit it and you know I can show it within a week um, I mean he had we would have people help him helping him from time to time but largely it was a solo effort uh, and then there was an act up live program where people would sit around and just um, answer people would call in and, and ask questions and, and answer it and they'd have certain things prepared but but that went on for several years so so there was this cable access we also had House of Color and yeah. Grand Fury. Those were two art groups inside ACT UP. Basically, affinity groups were like 20 to 30 people. So there were, if you consider there were four to 800 people in ACT UP, there were many, many, many affinity groups. And some of them were art related or media related. And it's all interconnected, like House of Color. Some of the people who were doing House of Color were also running this big lesbian bar called the Click Club, on the, and the, which was the first interracial lesbian bar in New York City, those were the same activists who were doing House of Color. So there was a big um, crossover between who was doing work inside ACT UP and the community, the, the culture in the community citywide. It was not isolated at all. It was very integrated. Yeah? How would the groups communicate between each other? Like, was there, like, four? You had a phone tree. Phone yeah. tree was... Um, <laughs> Each person had like 20 names they had to call. So you would get your call, and then you would call your 20 names and tell them whatever the message was. <laughs> well, because it's before it all the interviews. <coughs> right, I think that's one of the reasons why the Monday night meeting was you know, so crucial, because that, that way everybody could get together, people could talk to each other, but information could be um, you know, disseminated that way, but that there were always reports from committees and from from affinity groups, and there was a table in the back of um, actually two tables, each about the size of this one here, completely covered with stacks of of paper, with all sorts of information on all aspects of of the um, of the AIDS movement. How so and every, every week you'd come in and you know like you'd go down the table and you'd pick everything up and you know like you'd have this stack of paper to go home and, and read. Because not only was it before the internet, it was before answering machines. <laughs> you had to call the person until somebody would answer. Yeah. You mentioned a bit, um, I guess. Right. Just as activists that have been working and are now kind of still very active, like how do you view Occupy Wall Street? I have a very favorable view of that Occupy Wall Street. I think it's fantastic and amazing, and I'm so glad that it's happening. At the same time, I'm thinking ahead also. Where is it going? 
much. I have concerns about that. But, you know, it's a very American tradition, this type of movement. I mean, there were utopian socialists in the middle of the 19th century, and there were anarchists in the 20, in 1920s, and the hippie movement. In the 60s, these kind of spiritual total transformation movements, it's a very American thing. And they often create other movements that have very set agendas and are able to actually achieve change. However, they also can be easily co-opted. They can dissipate, and they also can be victimized by police violence. And that's one of my very big concerns for this movement. Because, you know, I, I remember like Kent State and Jackson State and these types of events, and, you know, I don't know where it's going. So right now, I love it. I hope it gets an agenda really soon of something. Of course, once you force something, you lose support. Because it's very easy to support a generic movement, right? Once they actually say what they want, they're going to lose some kind of support, and that's scary. But ultimately, if you want to create change, you have to. You can't just exist parallel to all the institutions you oppose. At some point, you have to approach them and confront them on some, on some grounds. Yeah. Um, that's basically my position, but I'm also you know, um, in the ironic position that um, I am completely focused on and concentrating on making this film about activism in an office two blocks from Occupy Wall Street. <laughs> <laughs> and I've hardly been there, you know, from, I, you know, every once in a while I just like force myself to get up and, and walk over there, but it's really, I think it's really great right now, so we'll But I will tell you that my students means. on Staten Island, many of them have never heard of it. Mm -hmm. And it's because if you don't watch TV, then you, look, you hear things by word of mouth. And their word of mouth is not conveying Occupy Wall Street. People they talk to every day are not talking about it. Because I brought it up in class like a month ago, and about half my students had never heard of it. So the class divide is a big issue. Except they're very much on, on the that side of the class divide. Aren't they? Yes, yeah. they're not in the 99. I mean, 99 percent is a is a vague category because as soon as you start standing for something, you're going to lose a lot of that 99 percent. Yeah. Yes. Um, or different. Uh, I wanted to ask you some some folks that I'm with are trying to do advocacy around um, ending um, treatment uh, waiting lists for ADAP. No, that's that's the big go. issue, isn't it? The waiting list for for I know that is huge, and yeah, our president even, has mm -hmm. lied to us about what he was going to. Yeah, that is huge. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to make the Democratic Party accountable for their promises to people with AIDS? That's the question that you're asking. I don't know, are you in CHAMP? Is that the group? No, that? I'm not. <laughs> okay. yeah. um, I used to be part of the Chicago Women's AIDS Project. Oh, okay. The United States Conference on AIDS is happening this week in Chicago, so mm -hmm. we were trying to strategize a little bit around that. Because um, a lot of women in Chicago were, at, were on, not in Chicago, but in some different states, on um, waiting lists for medication. And, um, I don't know if it's actually women specific, but people are. Well, women with AIDS are in the category of yes. poor people with yeah. AIDS. I mean, that's, yeah. No, that is the most pressing issue for people with AIDS right now, is those waiting lists. That's right. Yeah. Any other thoughts, questions? Yes? Did you encounter any issues when you were compiling all the footage for people protective of it at all or concerned with the final product and what it would be? Oh, well you mean originally when I created the collection for the New York Public Library or, or is, is that primarily you're only drawing on that? No, um, well, okay. Well, I, I first started um, putting that collection together in, in 1995 and um, you know I just called up people and, and said you know that this um, the library wanted wanted to collect the material, and they would they um, there was money to store it properly and also to um, remaster it. So so it, it would the the material would have a life afterwards. And, and some people 
were just ecstatic and they said, here, you know, it's been sitting in my closet, it's been sitting under my bed, please take it. And, and there were some people who were, you know, wary of it. And, um, there, um, like someone said to me, well, if I give my, up my material, it means I'm going to die. And I thought, you know, what do you, what do you say to that? And then, and then in one case, um, Ray Navarro, um, who died in 1990, um, uh, his, his mother had had his material for years and years, and so I went out to visit her in Simi Valley, California, and was in her um, living room, and she had taken all of Ray's tapes and spread it out over the living room. And it was like, you know, like Ray's body was sitting, lying there. And, and so I tried, like I bought her boxes, and I tried to get her to um, pack it up, but she just, she just couldn't do it. And in fact, um, she just recently, um, th there are other films being made, and, um, one by <coughs> David France, and she actually sent all the material to him. So this, that's how many years later? It's 15 years later, and she finally can, can deal with it. Um, the Testing the Limits people, there are six people who you know, um, well, some of them talked to each other, but not, not all six couldn't possibly get into a, a room for years and years. In fact, the reason that their material is at the New York Public Library was that it was in storage, and they could no longer pay for the storage. So the library just paid the past due rent and took the material. And in 15 years, they still haven't signed the agreement. The library just acts as if they had. But um, so they were, for ye years, they were incredibly protective of, of the material, but um, in the last couple of years, as I called them up and said, can I get these tapes? I mean, I have to list every tape I want and get permission from the copyright owner, because uh, the library doesn't, just owns the physical object, mm -hmm. not, not the, the copyright. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, suddenly it became really easy because people are realizing they, you know, they, they did this incredible thing 25 years ago, and it, what's important is that the material get used and get shown and, and in, in whatever different ways. So, so people have evolving feelings and attitudes towards, uh, towards the material. I will say that there's been nothing but appreciation from the ACT UP community towards Jim and I for doing this project. Nobody contested our right to do it. Everyone was relieved because nobody else wanted to do it. And last summer I did a screening for some old ACT UP people in LA and they really loved the film, which was a great relief to us. So there's been no problems in that regard. Yeah? I'm just curious what the effect on you guys is even in that short, because we watched every person we saw speaking at the 1995 through 1991, and so I'm curious what it's been like for you guys going back and having a, almost relive it and to kind of recall all that was lost as we were winning. We have different reactions. Yeah, you know, um, you know, I, I sit at a desk in a computer and, and watch this stuff over and over again, and uh, yeah, it's a very emotional experience. And um, but at the the same time, also um, in this footage, my friends are still alive. So so I feel like I'm um, I as a person who sur survived this. I have this responsibility to to those people who died, and that you know that's one of the reasons why I'm making the film. I just feel upset. And um, the fact that these people are forgotten. I mean, there are there's still this one guy. We can't find him. Rick yeah, Sempton. I mean, like, we have this footage. We, we only just figured out we had the wrong name, and then we figured out the right name, and no one knows where he is, and he's not on Facebook, and you can't Google him, which is usually bad news, right? But I don't want to say that he's dead, because I don't know that, and maybe he's incarcerated. I don't know where he is, and we've got this footage. And it's like, it's so difficult. All these great people, they're gone, 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 gone. Nobody remembers them. If they made it into the cut, then their name is up there, and if they didn't, 
they're gone, you know. We just look at footage saying, who's that, who's that, what's his name? He looks familiar, I remember him, who's that? You know, a lot of these people were completely forgotten. A lot of these people were driven out of their families. They were driven out of their bullshit small towns. They came here, they had a gay life, they died at 25. You know, there's no, there's no record of them. 80,000 people died in New York City of AIDS. Compare that to 9-11, right? And 9-11, all those 3,000 people are individuated every year, their names are read. These 80,000 people, who knows who they were? It's like they never lived. You know, so that's what I get out when I, when I watch it. It's upsetting, every single time. I've seen this film 40 times, it's upsetting. Yeah. Yes? Is there any um, of what you've seen, of what you experienced, um, any survivor guilt? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know, yeah, I don't, I don't understand that concept. No. I just... Uh, I mean, we're, di we're doing our responsibilities, right? So I don't feel guilty. <laughs> I'm proud of what we're doing. Yeah. Yeah, there is as well. People who you interviewed, like, just in general. I mean, there are people we've interviewed who have not talked about it since it happened. There's a lot of, un you know, there's a lot of people walking around who had people that they were very close to who died tragically and horribly in front of their eyes that all the people they know now don't even know that they went through that. It's, a, it's an undiscussed experience of the past. I mean, if you, any gay man you know who's over a certain age, you know, that, they live through that. I mean, so it's very invisible. I mean, nationwide, 500,000 people have died of AIDS in the United States. There's no memorial or anything like that. It's very, very invisible. So there's a trauma there. You know, and Jim was saying earlier that the whole gay marriage thing, in a way, is response to that trauma, to the to the, the AIDS trauma. You know, and it hasn't been articulated. I have a book coming out in February. It's called The Gentrification of the Mind, and it's about the confluence of AIDS and gentrification, and how it's changed the way we think, and how it's changed what urbanity is. And so I'm trying to say what are the consequences of AIDS, because that's the question that's not being asked. And I don't by that I don't mean to imply that AIDS has ended. Because there's two AIDS, right? There's ongoing AIDS, and then there's AIDS of the past. And they're two different phenomena. But AIDS of the past has incredible consequences. Because, I mean, when you're someone like us, you walk around the world, you see all the holes where all the people aren't. But other people don't see that. So I see all the absence, but you don't see it. You don't see it. So I see who's not running organizations, who didn't become a professor, who's not influencing things because they died at 25. I'm aware of that, but obviously you can't be aware of that. So it's a different, it's a different experience. Also, like I said, you know, I come from a, it's because, you know, like I said, we're both Jewish and we, we were post-Holocaust people, and so there's a certain kind of consciousness about that, about the, necess the necessity of telling certain stories, and, of, and also, later, of not letting those stories be co-opted for, for negative agendas either, you know, of, being, being truthful about what these events and seeing how they really, what their consequences really are. I'm very, I was raised with that, I'm very invested in that. Yeah. Thank you so okay, much. Thank, yeah, you. okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you.